should not be using language like that. That's not very nice. Especially considering I'm a Grammy nominee. Yeah, that's right. Can I tell you all the backstage Grammy dirt that I'm not supposed to say? Okay. Now, before the Grammys, there was this Grammy nomination concert that I got to go to. I saw that Taylor Swift. All right, now Taylor Swift is a tween country sensation. And I don't know how old she, she's like eight or 17 or, I'm not sure. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay, so she's a, uh, adorable, but did you know, and I didn't know this till I met her in person, she's eight feet tall. She is like a basketball player. She's unbelievably tall and she has, she looks like a beautiful 17 cover model. She's got long flowing blonde hair, but she was there. Okay, but here's the dirt. Did you know that right before that, she had been banging one of the Jonas Brothers who dumped her? And yeah, I know, where the fuck does he get off dumping a beautiful Taylor Swift? And here's another thing, and try not to turn on me, gays, but I don't get those Jonas Brothers. I'm sorry. I, I don't get it. I mean, I know what they do is harmless fun, but first of all, it was so embarrassing watching them on the Grammys with Stevie Wonder, wasn't it? when they were all like, Stevie, show me what you got. Hit me, Stevie. Oh, thank God he was blind. All right, so, I'm just saying. No, I'm just saying, I don't buy these three kids as sex symbols. I'm sorry. First of all, the middle one looks like Sanjaya. There's like that Sanjaya one where they just shaved him between his eyebrows. And I don't know their names. It, Jaime, Pishik, and Herb. I don't know, but one of them has the Jufro. Come on, cut the crap. And by the way, I am not apologizing. I am calling complete bullshit on their fucking fake purity rings. Oh, bullshit. Purity ring. Let me just say, I had a boyfriend in high school who wore a purity ring because he was saving himself for when he got married, and then he married a nice man named David. So. <laughs> So anyway, it turns out that apparently one of the Jonas Brothers dumped that gorgeous Taylor Swift, which is ridiculous. I think it was Pishik. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> but what I love is that she blabbed about it and she talked about it on radio shows and did a YouTube video. And so I thought, I like this girl. But what you didn't know, and you know, I was there in person, is that when she was singing in the concert, the Jonas Brothers were right in the front row like you guys. And during her song, she was staring daggers at the one that fucked her over. <laughs> I think it was Ariel. I'm not sure which one, but... <laughs> but it, it was fun to watch her just sing the song and like staring daggers at him the whole time. Me and Alicia Keys got very nervous. <laughs> you know, all of us in the music industry. So, so the concert was really fun and afterwards, you know, I got to meet the Foo Fighters, which was very exciting and all that stuff. I know, it was, it was very, very exciting. So then I get to go to the real live Grammys because they can't keep me out. And I actually had pretty good seats and everything. So I go and they have them at the Staples Center, which is, it's kind of too big. It's like 10,000 people. But I was doing the D-list, so of course it made me late for the actual Grammys. And, you know, of course the cameras weren't allowed inside the Grammys and, you know, they know better and stuff. So. Sure enough, I go to the Grammys and I, I drag poor Tom, my tour manager. You know Tom? Yes! He's a very big television star. Oh, okay, I have to get this. All right, we talked about it on the D-list a little bit last year, but I think this is really funny, but I know it's mean. All right, Tom's downstairs. Tom has this nervous disorder that I'm obsessed with. And what it is is when he gets nervous, you know what it is, when he gets nervous, he pulls out his eyelashes and his eyebrows. so random and weird. And um, it's called Ticatillomania. And so, yeah, and Tom is a raging Ticatillomaniac. And I think he could become the face of Ticatillomania if he really cared about his community. But anyway, so we go to the Grammys, and of course, you know, I'm late. And for a live show, what they do is they don't let you in if, you know, it's a live show and you have to wait in the lobby until a commercial break, and then they flood everybody in to go to their seats. So I missed the whole beginning, and I was so pissed. And then Tom and I go in, and I've got my tickets, and there's ushers everywhere, and none of the ushers are helping anybody because they're all taking pictures with the stars. So I'm holding my ticket, and then there's some usher just like taking a picture with Kanye. And, um, I don't mean the singer usher, but he was there as well. But there are all sorts of ushers. And 
So, but it's kind of nerve wracking because during the commercial break, you can hear the producers saying, okay, everybody take your seat. We need everybody in your seat in 20 seconds, take your seat. And I couldn't find my seat, nobody would help me. And then I hear them counting down, coming out of commercial in five, four, take your seats, three, two. And I'm like this. And then I swear to God, it's like eight feet away. I'm standing there and then the lights come up and it's live and Chris Martin from Coldplay is singing and I'm standing right here. Right, it was so embarrassing. And the camera guys who know me from various and sundry old award shows are like, Kathy, sit down. And I hit the deck on my stomach like an animal. And I'm like this at the Grammys. <laughs> Fucking wrong place, wrong time. Wrong place, wrong time, Sally. That's me. All right. I. I have a story for you that I hope will elicit the gay gasp. I hope you're impressed by this, but guess who I spent my birthday with? Cher, motherfuckers. Cher! I'm gonna try to get through this. All right, look, you have to understand, being a gay man, Naturally, this has been a dream for me my whole life. All right, so what happened was I won her in a bet. I don't know if anyone saw this <laughs> on the D-list last season, but my friend, Steve Wozniak, is, goes to this thing called the TED Conference. It's like a conference for geniuses, right? So Rosie O'Donnell really wanted to go to the TED Conference, and she said, do you think Woz would take me? And I said, yeah, I'll give you Woz, but what are you gonna give me? And she said, I can get you a meet and greet with Cher. I said, sold. All right, so. <laughs> So sure enough, we go to Vegas to see the Cher show in Vegas, which is fabulous, of course. And I should tell you about my wild Vegas girls weekend because I, I think this is pretty cool. So I go to Vegas and it's myself, Rosie O'Donnell, who's hysterical. By the way, every time she talks to me, whether we're in person or not, she starts with this. Griffin, it's O'Donnell. Which in person is like weird. On the phone it makes sense. Griffin, it's O'Donnell. I know, I see you. All right, so we went to the show and the show was fantastic, but I have to admit, I was kind of nervous because I was thinking, you know, I'm gonna meet her afterwards and I was sort of calming myself down. I was thinking, okay, Kathy, try not to queen out. Just try to relax. <laughs> Choose your words carefully for once. Just calm the fuck down. All right, so sure enough, the show ends and then we go downstairs and I'm getting nervous and Rosie's like, Griffin, relax. I was, I was like, is it O'Donnell? It's O'Donnell, okay. so. <laughs> So we're waiting, and then Cher comes in, and I know that this is a little bit niche, but gays, she was in the Just Like Jesse James look with the blonde wig, I know, and the jeans and the Navajo belt and the blue sparkles. Ah! So, okay, sorry. <laughs> Calm down, girl. Calm down. All right, so, so she walks in, and oh, by the way, I should warn you, I actually am the only comedian in the world who cannot do a Cher impression. So my impression is terrible, but the story's great. But I'm just warning you right now, I'm working on it. All right, so she walks in and I'm all excited and she looks fantastic. And I said, hi, it's so great to meet you. I'm Kathy Griffin. And then she says, I know a lot more about you than you think I do, Kathy Griffin. <laughs> I know, it's bad, right? I'm sorry, I know, sorry. So um, I was excited to even hear her say my name, you know? So I said, well, it's so great to meet you. And she mentioned watching the D-list. And I said, oh, come on, I don't believe you. You've watched the D-list? And she said, yes, and I said, prove it. And then Cher says to me, one time you had on Cesar Milan, the dog whisperer, and you tried to trade your Emmy to see if the dogs would go on the treadmill, and they did. <laughs> so, okay. See, then the floodgates came open, and it was so awful. I just queened out on her so hard. I, I was just like, oh, thank you so much. I thought your show was excellent. And I thought the uh, montages were very good. And I really enjoyed your costumes because you knew that Mackie was a visionary when no one else did. And I enjoyed the live version of Bang Bang. I mean, I like the studio version of Bang Bang as well, but the live version is so dramatic. It was, yeah, it was. So the next day, I'm back in LA and Tom comes over and he's like, Rosie's on the phone. So. I, um, you know, I walked out of a pile of lashes on the floor, and then I go, hey, and she goes, Griffin, it's O'Donnell. I know. So, so she goes, Griffin, you're not gonna believe this, but I just got a call from Cher, and she wants your phone number, she wants to call you. 
I know, and I'm nervous. I'm like, what did I do? What did I do? What did I say? Because whenever a celebrity wants to contact me, it never goes my way. It's not, you know, I'm like, what am I fired? Fired from life? What How did I get, what am I fired from? You know? And so then she goes, no, I talked to her. And she says she thinks you're a cool, smart chick and she like wants to hang out. So I'm gonna give you your number if that's all right. And I was like, of course give her my number. That's so exciting. So then Rosie goes, no, Griffin, look, you can never forget. It's fucking Cher, okay? It's fucking Cher. <laughs> and <laughs> I said, I get it. I said, how, are, how do you ever forget it's Cher? I said, nobody I have lunch with is gonna have like a sparkly silver wig on. Believe me, I'm not gonna forget <laughs> it's fucking Cher. So I said, really, she wants to call me? That's really exciting. So then, sure enough, a couple of days later, Cher texts me. Now, let me tell you the best part. When she calls, it doesn't come up private caller. It doesn't come up unknown. It doesn't even come up numbers. It literally comes up Cher. <laughs> I know. And so it's like, bloop, bloop, share, diarrhea. I mean, it was, <laughs> it's exciting. Every time she calls, it just goes, share. All right, so finally, after we had been texting a couple of months, I texted her and I said, um, are we ever gonna do anything in person? I feel like you're my match.com boyfriend. And, <laughs> and then she writes back, you crazy bitch, you're just trying to get in my house. Um, <laughs> which is true, um, <laughs> who wouldn't? So I texted her and I said, hey, um, my birthday is on Tuesday and I would love it so much if I could spend it with you. Can I come over and hang out? Um, I'll bring a cake and I'm really nervous about turning the big 3-0. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so she writes back, you crazy bitch, your age hasn't had a three in front of it for a lot of fucking years. So. <laughs> And then she writes, what kind of cake? So, so I knew I was in and I said, marble cake with chocolate chocolate chip frosting on the inside and buttercream on the outside. All right, so then I go, where do you live? So, all right, she sends me her address and I'm actually going to tell you Cher's address and you'll see why it is not a breach of security in any way. This is how A-list she is. She writes, go to Malibu, turn left, turn right at my house. <laughs> yeah. Her address is just share California. Like, <laughs> it's like writing a letter to Santa. Santa, North Pole, share United States. So, so sure enough, it's, you know, my birthday, and I'm going to shares, and I'm so excited, and I get my birthday cake, but then I'm thinking, is it, is it kind of tacky to bring my whole birthday cake to shares? That's kind of weird, and, you know. So I, all right, I just made a call, and so I decided to cut off, like, a big hunk of it and put it on a plate with some foil on top. I know, it was, okay, I didn't, I didn't think. All right, I just... I just thought it'd be weird to bring Cher a cake. I mean, she, she wears an outfit, she doesn't need fucking cake. All right, so sure enough, it's my birthday, and I'm driving to Malibu with one hand on the steering wheel and one hand carrying this piece of foil-wrapped cake, like I just left a picnic. It was weird, I know, but I kept looking at it, and as I looked at it, it seemed to get smaller and smaller, and it seemed like a bad idea, but I just went with it. So sure enough, I drive up to her uh, palace, and, um, and you should know, by the way, that there's a, an armed guard in a guard gate. Yeah, so I could just get killed at Cheers and finally be the lead story on Entertainment Tonight. Um, here's hoping. So I get in and the assistant comes out to meet me and I've got my stupid piece of foil wrapped cake. And she goes, what's that? And I was like, uh, it's, mm, mm, it's my, my birthday and it's a cake. It's like a part of a, it's like a piece of, it's a big piece of, and she goes, all right. So she just takes it. So um, I walk in and the place is so big that I start going, hello? Hello? Can anyone hear me? And then the assistant goes, oh, you can stop doing that bit. Her room is so far away, she won't even hear you. And I was like, easy, Chris Brown. Um, so... <laughs> All right, so, so sure enough, we're walking through Cher's palace, and then walk past the Oscars and the Golden Globes and all that stuff. Then we go to her room. All right, so I'm in Cher's bedroom. And by the way, you could hear a gay pin drop right now. I love it. I love it. I 
know, it's awesome. So I walk in her bedroom and it's the size of a football field. I mean, I think they have Monday night football there on off nights. It's gigantic. So I walk in and once again, I'm going, hello, hello. Send a chopper for the hikers, we're lost. All right, so then Cher walks out. Shut up, you crazy bitch. And there she is in all her sheerness. She looks fantastic, no makeup. She's in like a, like a zippy and like a, a warm-up suit. And by the way, a little fun fact, did you know that Cher's real hair is long, thick, straight black hair? Her real hair is Cher hair. I never knew that. I didn't know her actual hair. It's just Cher hair. I'm telling you, you put, you put a headdress on her and a white horse and she's good to go for half breed. Boom, ready. Um, that's her real hair, down here. Okay, so she walks in and it was, honestly, it was a dream birthday and we sat on her couch and we just shot the breeze for like five hours and it was fun and she was lovely and so at the end of it, I said, okay, I gotta get out of your hair, your Cher hair. But I was like, okay, I gotta leave. And so then she says, hold on a second, I got a little birthday presentation for you. So she goes out and she comes back with this really awesome gift basket that she's made up for me. And it's, she's kind of spiritual, so it's got all of her like favorite lotions and potions and scented candles and all that shit. And all I'm thinking is, oh my God, it's a gift bag from Cher. And so I say to her, as a joke, I go, this kind of looks like a re-gift from an Oscar gift suite. So I know, so she goes, what the fuck is a re-gift? I'm Cher. <laughs> You know what I think we really, really need in the White House is one good financially focused lesbian. Who's with me? Susie Orman, 2012. <laughs> Susie Orman, 2012. I love her. There is nothing a good focused lesbian can't do. Nothing. You move Susie Orman into the White House, you know the lesbians. She will remodel it, flip the White House, sell it to the Chinese for a profit. Nothing the lesbians can't do. She would turn around the financial crisis in eight days. I'm not kidding. And she'd be like training, like walking seven dogs at one time and caulking a tub. Okay, so here is the news flash about my mother, your beloved Maggie Griffin, moved out of my house. Yeah, how about that shit? That's right, my mother moved out. Now, let me just say that I thought I was being such a wonderful and responsible daughter to move my frail, elderly, alcoholic mother into my home. <laughs> oh yes, she loves her box of wine, doesn't she? <laughs> loves it! You know her big expression now? Tip it! <laughs> Tip it, Kathleen, cause the spigot's not working and there's still some more wine in the plastic bag. You gotta tip it! Tip it. And I do. <laughs> God help me. You know, it's funny, I used to get upset by my mom and dad's drinking. I really did. When I was young, I used to cry. You guys shouldn't drink so much. My dad lived to be 90. My mom is 88. Fuck it, bottoms up. Fuck it. <laughs> Yeah, so she moved out of my house. And by the way, I had her hooked up. You should know, she had her own room, her own separate entrance, her own kitchen. I have an elevator in my house for my mom. I, like, like I live in a fucking mall, all right, just for her. <laughs> yes, I had her hooked up. And um, so yeah, she moved in with me and I thought everything was going fine. And that bitch moved out. And let me tell you why, because it's a night of honesty. I, I said, mom, why, why don't you wanna live with me? I thought this was, a dream of yours. And it turns out that my mother <laughs> moved out of my house. You know, Maggie, she tells it like it is, because she finds me annoying. <laughs> Can I tell you, that 88-year-old thing, it's a fucking license to kill. Like, when they get, right, they get to that age and they just don't give a fuck, they say whatever they feel, and oh no, my mother, will play the age card, she will play you like a fiddle. First of all, have you noticed that? First, she, first of all, she has a walker she doesn't need. I just want you to know that. When you see her with a walker, she doesn't need it. It's for pity. It's to garner pity or donations or to carry the drink, you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. And she's got a fanny pack in there, which, all right, my, 
My mother's fanny pack on her walker is like fucking New Jack City at this point, all right? I, I had to, I don't, you raise them, you do the best you can, and then you gotta just put them on the walker and let them go. Um, all right, so I'm gonna say something about my mom that might sound harsh, but I can explain, so just hear me out. My mother is a returning motherfucker. Hear me out, hear me out, no, no. My mother can return anything to Nordstrom for cash. Anything, right? They love it, they live for that shit. My mother could return a half-eaten hot dog to Nordstrom for cash. Because they play that age card. My mom does it, it's like a sick game. She doesn't need it, she doesn't need it. But she gets like a sick joy out of it. So she'd go to Nordstrom with a fake walker, and she's always got some item she didn't buy at Nordstrom, and she lays it on thick. Honey, sweetheart, I need to return this, and oh, honey, I don't have the receipt, but um, I'd like the cash back, because I need food to survive. And then, <laughs> don't fall for it. If you work at Nordstrom, do not fall for it. And yes, and then she'll come home, and she'll be like, I got 17 bucks from Nordstrom. And she's all, oh yeah, she's all proud of herself. So. There are, there are many odd things that are giving her pleasure. Oh, you know what is like triple X porn for old people? They love Judge Judy. <laughs> My mom is like Rain Man with Judge Judy. It is all about Judge Judy. I like that Judge Judy. She tells it like it is, Kathleen. She would put you in your place. She's not taking any of your goddamn guff, that's for sure. I'd like to see you on that show. She'd smack you right in your smart mouth. And it's true, Judge Judy will cut a bitch. That we know, yes. Oh no, my mom said this to me. She actually said, she goes, why can't you get any of your goddamn agents to get you a guest spot on Judge Judy? A guest spot, like it's fucking Grey's Anatomy, you know? I said, I said, mom, to get a guest spot on Judge Judy, I would have to commit a crime. How about you shut your goddamn mouth? Oh yeah. License to kill, it's a license to kill. I have to tell you what I walked in on last week and I honestly wish, yes, I wish you could have been there. So first of all, all right, so she's in her room because she splits her time between her condo and my house, right? So she's in her room and I'm walking down the hall thinking I'm being a good daughter, checking on my frail and elderly mother. First of all, the TV is blasting like a Def Leppard concert. Blasting, the walls are shaking, right? But have you noticed how at that age they have the selective hearing? So even though the TV has to be at level 10, she hears my footsteps coming down the hall. Cause then I hear her panic. And I hear this, oh Christ, where's the goddamn clicker? She's coming, oh shite, I gotta change it. I can never find that goddamn clicker. What the fuck is she watching? That she's so afraid, I'm gonna catch her, what is it? A snuff film? I don't know, I don't know anymore. I'm sorry. All right, here's the thing. My mom, she doesn't know how to be a normal old person. That's her problem. She doesn't know that it would just comfort me if just once I could walk in on her watching Murder, She Wrote? <laughs> Matlock? Father Dowling's Mysteries? Something, no. This is what I walk in on. My mom is sitting up in bed in the moo, -moo with the brownie smudge here. Bake lay chips all over her lap. Yes, the dogs are in bed with her and they're not allowed in bed. And by the way, the dogs love when she dog sits. They're like licking her legs and stuff. Oh, they're in hog heaven. Because you know, you never know what food particles might fall from her moo moo into their mouths. So they're loving it. And then on the nightstand where some of you may have a Bible or an alarm clock, tip it. Yeah, the box, don't worry. It's right where you left it. The ever-present box of wine. And I catch my own mother watching Keeping Up with the Fucking Kardashians. <laughs> like a dagger in my heart. Why do I bother? Why? On the D-list, we're working hard for you. We're performing in Iraq at a maximum security prison, on an airplane for the gays between San Francisco and Sydney. I mean, we're gigging, baby. What the fuck do they do on the Kardashians? There's a one chick with a big ass making a sex tape. Why do I bother? My mother loves it. I can't help it, Kathleen. They're just such skanks. 
All right, so do you want to hear all the backstage dirt? Because I'm a two-time Emmy winner, motherfuckers. <laughs> OK. First of all, let me just say that I, I truly, truly can't believe it. And you know, uh, as a member of the Television Academy of Arts and Sciences, let me just say that they don't care for it when I say things like this, and you're supposed to be gracious when you're nominated, and not even think these thoughts. But since it is a night of honesty, I just have to admit, I wanted to win! I wanted to win that thing so bad, I would have fucked a donkey for that Emmy! God help me! God help me! Hi. And it's an honor just to be nominated. Okay, now first of all, uh, you know that this year was different for me because I was asked for the first time to present at the Fancy Smancy Primetime Emmys, which I've never been you know, asked to do before. So my whole goal was, you know the Creative Arts Emmys, the Schmemmys, are the week before the really fancy Emmys? So my whole goal was I didn't want to get canned in between the Schmemmys and the Emmys. <laughs> so I had to watch my mouth for once, you know, and try not to tell deities to suck it and stuff like that. So, and for the real Emmys, I was actually presenting with the great Don Rickles. So I didn't want to fuck this up, you know, it was a big deal. So sure enough, the Schmemmys happened the week before, and it was still exciting, but I have to tell you, my category is just getting more and more ridiculous. First of all, go ahead and make fun of reality. That shit is hard to win, here's why. So first of all, there's my little half-assed dog and pony show. Then I'm up against um, Deadliest Catch, which is, yes, which is a fishing show where people fish to death. <laughs> they die fishing to death on Delia's Catch. Okay, so then there's um, Extreme Home Makeover. Hey, how do you build a house in four days? <laughs> you do it with your girlfriend, Crystal. Um, <laughs> then the next one is, of course, Every year, Antiques Roadshow, where they go town to town pricing your tchotchkes. Okay, fine. And then, the last one, intervention. Yeah, thank you, exactly. It's hard to win an Emmy up against that. Are you kidding? Oh, I gotta say this. So the night before, they have this cocktail party for the nominees. I call it one of the Emmy kiss-ass parties. Because Emmy week, I will go to any Emmy party I can, whether I'm invited or not, and I just go to kiss Emmy ass. I want it, I am in it to win it, bend over, Mwah! Who's next, Academy? So, so I met this party the night before, and then this guy comes over to me, and he, I have to say he has a little bit of an attitude. And he goes, are you Kathy Griffin? And I said, yes, and I'm there in the cocktail dress and the heels and everything. And he goes, yeah, well, uh, I'm the producer of Intervention. Like that, but with kind of like a tone, you know? And I said, oh, well, your show's really good. I, I think I've seen everyone. You know, I've seen, you know, Gabe the Gambler and the fucking Huffing Girl with the crazy voice. I've seen it, I get it. <laughs> but then, for some reason, he kind of steps up to me and then he goes, well, they tell me it's my year. <laughs> Don't. with my Emmy dream. <laughs> don't talk that way around little Emmy. I covered her ears. Shh, don't listen. He's a bad man, baby. All right. And I don't know what came over me, but I just turned to him and I said, look, fucker. <laughs> Unless you are doing a very special intervention starring Whitney Houston, back the fuck off. <laughs> You'd watch that, right? That'd be a good intervention. <laughs> this week on a very special intervention, Bobby! <laughs> Bobby! <laughs> That's how you get yourself an Emmy, my friend, right there. All right, so, 
So I really, really thought intervention was going to win, right? So I go to the Shmemis, and sure enough, this year at the Shmemis, I don't know how they pulled it out, but they had some big stars at the Shmemis. So I look across the aisle, and there's Tom Hanks at the Shmemis, because he produced John Adams, which was great on HBO. All right, so he's there. And then I look further down the aisle, and I see James Gandolfini. Tony Soprano. I know. It was big time. And I've seen every episode of The Sopranos. So I don't know how the Shmemis did it, but it was big time star action this year. Now, there's a green room at these events where all the celebrities gather who are presenting. And I, of course, was not asked to present because when you tell Jesus to suck it, they don't ask you back, <laughs> always. Um, Yes. All right, so I go to the lobby to try to bullshit my way back into the green room, and then in the lobby, I see James Gandolfini. Now, this is a big fucking star, and my whole career, I'm, you know, watching what celebrities do what, and who's got a big posse, and who seems nice, and who's drunk, and all that shit, and I've never seen anyone as famous as he is not being bothered by people. Everybody else was being bothered by all kinds of people for, you know, sign my t-shirt for my cousin, take a picture, do my outgoing phone message, all that stuff. But James Gandolfini has sort of this vibe about it. I call it the James Gandolfini ring of fire. <laughs> and it's kind of like he is Tony Soprano and nobody was going up to him because there's something about him that just seems to say, don't fucking, don't come, no, don't come, don't come up to me, don't do it. He was there because he produced this really good HBO special called um, A Live Day Memories about the returning injured Iraq vets. So I went up to him and I said, excuse me, Mr. Gandolfini, but my name is Kathy Griffin and I thought your special was fantastic and I just did a show at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and I know those guys just think you're a total rock star. So then James Gandolfini says to me, uh, are you, are you gonna be here later? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And he goes, uh, cause uh, some people I was in the limo with were talking about you and they wanted to meet you. So are you gonna be here later? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who the fuck in James Gandolfini's limo knows who I am and wants to meet me? Big pussy? I don't think so. So. <laughs> I was determined to get to the bottom of it, and you're gonna love this. I don't know how I couldn't have figured it out. It turns out that he just got married, and his, it was his brand new wife's hair and makeup gaze. Duh! Oh, I know. What was that limo ride like? Girl, we have got to meet Kathy Griffin. Girl, you don't know what she's gonna say. I could ask her. All right, so. So anyway, sure enough, it's the Shmemmies and my category comes up and I go back to my seat. And like I said, I wanted to win so fucking bad. I can't help it. I like those Emmys more than people. I think they're better and more important than people. I, I think they're more important than any of your children, even though they're gifted. Um, <laughs> so, so I just wanted to win. All right, so my category comes up and my heart, I thought I was gonna be able to actually see it like beating out of my chest. But remember, I have to be gracious because I'm presenting the next week with Don Rickles. So I can't pull my usual Jesus can suck it, I need that bullshit. I have to be gracious. And I'm imagining that they're gonna say the winner is intervention and then I have to do this shit. Oh, good for those crackheads. That's great. <laughs> wow, they did a lot of crack to win that Emmy. <laughs> so I'm just, so sure enough, it's my category, and they announce the Emmy goes to Kathy Griffin, my life on the D-list. I run up on stage, I can't believe it. And inside my head, all I'm thinking is, do not tell Jesus to suck it. Don't tell Allah to suck it. Don't tell Oprah to suck it. Don't tell Scientology to suck it. Calm the fuck down, bitch. And don't get fired. Do not get fired. Try to keep your job. But, oh. God, it was heaven. All right, and I'm standing there, and I'm all jacked up on adrenaline, and I really, really was shocked. And so, the reason they did not air this moment on the E! Channel recap show was because I um, lost my mind for a second, and <laughs> here's what happened. All right, so I'm standing there holding the Emmy, shaking like a leaf, I can't believe it, and then I look into the audience, and I see James Gandolfini in the third row, and I started talking to him from the stage. <laughs> as if I know him. Ooh, ooh. Um, I know, it was bad. And so I'm holding the Emmy, and I'm not on the microphone, and I'm going like this, James, look, I won. Can you believe it, I won? And Gandolfini's like, I don't fucking know her. I don't even know. 
the people in the limo, but I don't. And his wife is laughing, and I'm not getting it. I'm like, can you believe it? We were talking, and I won. And then James Gandolfini does this thing. I'll never forget it. He puts his chin on his thumb like this, and he goes like this. You won. <laughs> it's my James Gandolfini moment. All right. It was exciting. So, the next week is the real deal, the big show, the primetime Emmys, and I am going as a presenter. So first of all, I get to walk the red carpet in my beautiful gown by a young gay designer that I was so proud of. I was on the worst dress list by the time I got home. But it's, I come home for the Emmys, I put on the Yahoo homepage, and there's my picture. I'm already the worst dress, and I'm watching it in the dress. I'm still in the dress. Clicking on it, looking at a picture of myself on the worst dress. I stand by that dress. I liked it. Um, all right. So, so sure enough, I go and this is big time star action. I mean, the green room at the Real Emmys is just one big star after another. It was really cool. I don't know how I scored such good tickets, but I was sitting in the best section you could. I was sitting with the 30 Rock people. I love that show. It's my favorite show. Oh, I love it. All right. So um, I was in the second row and I was behind uh, Tina Fey and Alec Baldwin. And I have to tell you, I was seated next to the best person you can be seated next to at a formal event, Tracy Morgan. Yeah. So I know. But OK, so we're, we're a, I'm sitting next to him and he's with this beautiful girl. And I said, Tracy, what's the name of your lady friend? And he goes, I don't know, Kathy Griffin, but she's fine. <laughs> Technicality with the name. All right. so. <laughs> so the show starts, and Oprah came out at the very beginning. So she comes out, and she's in this beautiful gown, and there's Oprah like 15 feet away. And it's exciting, because I'm looking at Oprah, you know, excited to see Oprah, right? And she's, you know, she picked our president, let's face it. She just decided, and she just picked him. Um, and that's fine with me. I think she should just, just keep picking. She did a good job. But we, you know, we can act like we voted, but Oprah just fucking picked him. Um, <laughs> She worked out pretty well. So sure enough, I, I'm watching Oprah, and she's talking, and she's doing kind of this serious speech. And of course, you know, when Oprah talks, we all shut the fuck up. And uh, she'll cut a bitch. All right, and, and sure enough, she's doing this kind of serious speech about the history of television and how television can teach people. But keep in mind, she's 15 feet away. So then Tracy Morgan just starts, and he's right next to me, and he goes, Kathy, look at Oprah, like that loud. Now, you know, I'm scared of Oprah, and Gail, as well, I think would kill me. So if I ever show up dead, go to Oprah's house first, and then Ryan Seacrest, and one of them will have done it. Anyway, for once, I was actually nervous that someone else was being too loud, and I go, Tracy, shh. So he goes, I can't help it, Kathy. Look at Oprah thinking she all Oprah shit. <laughs> At this point, I get what I call the church giggles. <laughs> and that's when you're laughing inappropriately hard at an inappropriate time. And the more you try to stop, the more you laugh. And Tracy knows he has me exactly where he wants me. So my shoulders are starting to go. And I'm actually, Oprah's so close to me, I'm afraid she's going to hear me doing this. <laughs> like when you're laughing, and you go <gasps> like that. I'm thinking Oprah could just fire me, like, from life. You know, like, I'm fired from life. Um, so I'm trying to get Tracy to shut up because I can't stop laughing, and he knows he asked me, and then he goes, I'm sorry, Kathy, this has just been a really hard day for me. I had a DNA test, and I found out that my natural father is Ernest Borgnine. <laughs> and I just can't stop laughing, and he goes, my whole life I thought it was William Hurt. And I'm like, <laughs> So then, I go back to the green room, and it's just celebrity, 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 celebrity. And I, you know, this is like a big deal for me. And I have to tell you, I was next to this table of young girls, like 19, 20-year-old girls, and they were, you know, a table full of interns. And I'm gonna be honest, I got a little attitude. I was thinking, you know, I've worked my whole career to be at the green room of the Emmys, and now I get back here, and I find out they just let anybody in, some intern chicks. 
And then they turned around and I realized it was the Desperate Housewives. Um, <laughs> all right, so look, these are gorgeous girls, we all know that, but <laughs> let's cut the shit with the face work. First of all, <laughs> Marsha Cross's face looked like a hockey rink. I, no, no, her forehead has not moved since the episode of Melrose Place where she took the wig off and there was stitching on her head. Let's cut the shit. Come on, come on, Portland. You've come this far. <laughs> no, I just, look, I just think it's funny when celebrities actually try to act like they haven't had face work. So I, I just love when they're willing to just go to the mat and insist they haven't had anything done. And so I'm looking at Hatcher, who's very gorgeous, but I'm thinking, really, you just woke up Korean? Is that how it went down, Terry? <laughs> um, So I'm in the green room, and then Alec Baldwin walks in. Now, Alec Baldwin is a big time star, gorgeous guy, he's working the dinner jacket, but he's a tightly wound motherfucker. Like, you know what I mean? He just walks into a room like this. Now, it was a crowded green room, and I was sitting there, and even though it was crowded, no one was sitting next to me for some reason. It was some weird, I, I don't know, confusion. So, of course, Alec Baldwin doesn't give a shit about me, so he plops down right next to me, he's got a drink, and it was so funny, he just started laying into me. He goes like this, what happened to you? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, what made you like this? What, do you have a crazy family? I go, you should fucking talk, Baldy. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, I have to tell you my favorite Emmy rehearsal moment. So I walk in to rehearsal, and this is who I see on the couch. Don Rickles, sitting next to Betty White, sitting next to Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> I know, this is some big time shit. I mean, I I'm trying to act all casual, but I'm, I'm shitting inside. I mean, I'm trying to act like, hey, these are my peers, just another gig, be yourself. I'm dying inside, you know? So um, I know Don Rickles, I've had dinner with him. I know Betty White, who's just a pistol, and I've never met Mary Tyler Moore. So I'm thinking, okay, Kathy, just come on, just keep it together. So I sit down next to Mary Tyler Moore, and they're all talking, they all know each other. And I turn to Mary Tyler Moore, who looks great, and I said, Mary Tyler Moore, you look like a million bucks. And she said, thank you, and walked away from the crazy lady. Um, I just came on too strong, I know, as usual. So anyway, she walks away, and then Don Rickles says, do you know Mary? And I said, no, I've never met her. And he goes, she's not exactly what you'd call social, and rolls his eyes. <laughs> so obviously he was just making fun, but I was just teasing him, and I said, Don, did you ever sleep with Mary? And he just said no and laughed. And then Betty White goes, I fucked him. 